Let me introduce to you very briefly our key lecturer who needs no introduction. Professor Mamdani is a household name from Kisoro to Karamoja, from Gulu to Kalangala. You will be very much in doubt as a Ugandan if you do not know Professor Mamdani. They can actually recall your passport if you say, I've never heard of that name. Professor Mahmoud Mabdani is Herbert Lehman Professor of Government at Columbia University. Until February 2022, he was the Executive Director of the Makerere Institute of Social Research, where he spearheaded the establishment of the first ever interdisciplinary doctoral program in social studies. An experiment which 10 years ago has turned MISA into a very acclaimed knowledge producing center in Africa, south of Sahara, and north of Limpompo. I thought that deserves a hand clap. <laughs> Needless to remind you that I am um, an alumnus of the MISA experiment. He earned his PhD from the Harvard University in 1974, just under two years after the expulsion of Uganda Asia, whose 50th anniversary we are reflecting upon today. Professor Mamdani's first academic book to hit the university shelves, stemming from his doctoral thesis, came out in 1976. It was titled Politics and Class Formation in Uganda. But little known, and yet perhaps most consequential for the discussion today is Mamdani's book titled From Citizen to Refugee. The book came in 1973, produced from his uh, forced migration experiment in Britain. Professor Mamdani's latest publication is titled Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities. It was published by his alma mater, Harvard University Press, in the thick of the COVID lockdown. Today, we are going to have a 50 years anniversary reflection, and Professor Pamdani has volunteered to take us back on a half a century journey, a diet which was very much present when it was being cooked, served, and today reserved for us to. Let's welcome Professor Pamdani for his keynote, uh, for his lecture today. Prof, the floor is yours. Good morning. I'm not very good at uh, formalities. Maybe that's why I never went into diplomatic service. So I'm just going to say a general but heartfelt thank you to all the organizers. I will only mention one name of Barney Afako who actually volunteered me. I didn't volunteer myself. Barney, thank you. I left Uganda in uh, November 1972, during the last week of the expulsion for a refugee camp in London. Six months later, I took my first academic job at the University of Dar es Salaam. After the fall of Amin, I came to Kampala as a frontier intern in mission 
with the All Africa Conference of Churches, with an office at the Church of Uganda headquarters in Mengo. The next year, 1980, I joined Makerere University. I made it a point to ask most people I met about their thoughts on the expulsion. Almost all responded, it was bad how Amin did it. Nobody said the expulsion was bad. I realized that most Ugandans did not oppose the expulsion. This was the beginning of wisdom for me. Ten years later, I began asking the same question to friends, neighbors, and schoolmates from pre-72 Uganda days. All Uganda Asians, wherever I met them, in Kampala or in Britain. It was time for a second surprise. Over 90% said they would not want to return to the pre-72 days in Uganda. They too were not opposed to the expulsion. So my first observation, how come over 90% of residents of the country, black or brown, would not want to return to the days and years before the 1972 expulsion? The expulsion cannot just be understood as an event as a single standalone event, an event which occurred in 1972, the event needs to be understood as the culmination of a process. Long before 1972, many Ugandan Asians had been disenfranchised by law. And the law I'm talking about is both Ugandan and British. The Citizenship Clause in the Independence Constitution of 1962 restricted citizenship by birth to those who were born of Ugandan parents and one of whose grandparents was also born in Uganda. My guess is that no more than 10% of people of Asian descent with a permanent residence in Uganda would have qualified for citizenship by birthright under this clause. Citizenship by registration or any other type of citizenship is not a right. It's a privilege conferred on you by the state. It can be withdrawn just as easily by the state. The 1995 Constitution changed the requirement for citizenship, substituted individual requirements for citizenship with birth, sorry, by birth, citizenship by birth to a group requirement. Now, not the individual, but the group had to be indigenous to the country. Schedule 3 of the 1995 Constitution had a list of indigenous tribes. By this criterion, no Uganda Asian could be a citizen by birth after 1995. Under British law, Asian residents of Uganda lost the right of entry or the right of return, depending on how you look at it, to the UK after 1968, even if they were holders of British passports. The 
the British distinguished between different kinds of citizens, and I will come to that later. My second observation. We need to distinguish between two different groups of Asians. Those pre-72 and those post-85. For the pre-72 group, Uganda was home. For most of the second group, the post-85 group, Uganda is a temporary abode. My talk will focus on the first group. Now to my topic. What have we learned over half a century? Learning is both formal and informal. Learning is also individual and group learning, collective learning. I'm going to begin with formal learning. This is a university dedicated first and foremost to formal learning. We read books and sometimes we write. So I'm going to begin by talking about four books on this subject which are an important part of what we have learned over the last 50 years. The first is a book by Ian Sanjay Patel. Is this uh, for COVID or for me? I note she brought it only to me. Nobody else has been given this privileged treatment. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the first book is by Ian Sanjay Patel, The Study of British Immigration Policy. It's titled, We Are Here Because You Were There, Immigration and the End of Empire, published last year. Sanjay Patel's book begins with the 1968 Act, British Parliamentary Act, which differentiated between two groups of British citizens, white and non-white, historical and non-historical, distinguishing kith and kin from strangers. During the Asian expulsion, the British cabinet and bureaucracy came up with a new language to make this same racialized distinction. When writing of Uganda and discussing Uganda and British citizens in Uganda, they distinguished between what they call belongers, those who belong. Belongers were white. And non-white UKPH, meaning United Kingdom passport holders, which were eventually classified as refugees. The effect of these two sets of legislation, one in Uganda, the other in Britain, was like that of a pincer movement which disenfranchised many Uganda Asians before any were expelled. The numbers disenfranchised ran into thousands. My second book has to do with the claim that Uganda Asians were victims. There has developed, since 1972, a global industry portraying Uganda Asians as victims. Few in my generation, the first generation of those expelled, wrote of our experience. As a people, we were not chroniclers. We were also not given to reflecting on our own experiences critically. It is the children of refugees, second generation, who have attempted to address this deficit. These hand-me-down stories have gradually homogenized 
into victim narratives. But Uganda Asians are a poor fit as victims. For a start, the expulsion meant different things for different groups among Uganda Asians. For a substantial group, the lowest estimates are upwards of 12,000. So for upwards of 12,000 people, the expulsion liberated them from an impossible situation. According to intelligence reports, Uganda intelligence reports, something like 12,000 Asian residents of Uganda were stateless by 1971. They were without a right to work in the country. They had no right to, no trading license. Eventually no homes. At first they lived in places of worship, temples, mosques, gurudwaras. With an increase of numbers, they overflowed into one-room tenements. In the word of Bob Astles, an intelligence officer under Robote, and under Amin, these tenements resemble, quote, concentration camp-like conditions. By 1970, they were dem demonstrating almost every other day in front of the British High Commission. The first secretary of the British High Commission, Lee, a young man, probably his first job, empathized with them. He concocted a scheme with three Asians to have himself kidnapped onto an island in Entebbe so as to create a global scandal and to put the Uganda Asian story on the front pages of newspapers. Well, it didn't work. The British government and the Obote government got together, had a court case and sent him to London, disgraced him, accused him of having had a sex holiday on this island with women on the island. This group, 12,000, celebrated the expulsion. For them, Amin had opened the gates of Britain. Finally, they could look forward to another life. When I went to London, I met a friend of mine. He lived in a council house, council flat, a flat given by a local council to indigent families. He took me to the flat, showed me the rooms, including the prayer room. In the prayer room were photographs, gods and goddesses. But among them was the photograph of Idi Amin. He said, what's this? He turned to his mother. And the mother said to me, where would we be without him? He is the one who got us out of a terrible situation in Uganda. We have a council flat, we have free education, we have free medicine, subsidized transport, our children go to school, we have a future. He's like a god for us. In the next years I re realized that my friend's family was not the only one. There were many other families in that same position. Those who celebrated the expulsion. 
One book stands out in the chorus that I call the expulsion industry for its rare honesty. This is a novel called Kalolo Hill. Kalolo Hill is a novel by Nima Shah, lives in London. It's the portrayal of an Indian family. It's written through the eyes of a young bride, Asha, who has just married into the family. The bride comes from Jinja, family lives on Kalolo Hill. The family is a rich merchant family. The book narrates Asha's journey, which is one of discovery. Day by day, she discovers the lies and deceptions that had become so much a part of life for Indian business families. So much a part of life that they seem normal and no longer abhorrent. As her world unravels, it peels like an onion, layer by layer, bringing the daily business of the Asian merchant community to light and raising a big question mark about the now standard and uniform story of Asian victims of theft, rape, violence, commonplace in the genre of expulsion stories. It is worth noting that there was no large-scale loss of life during the expulsion. I was in Kampala all three months. There were a few exceptions but no large-scale loss of life. In a land known for sporadic massacres, there were no massacres of Asians. When massacres happened, they were of indigenous people. Also, there was hardly any large-scale theft. This should not be surprising, given that the expulsion itself was one big generalized theft. It left little room for individual thefts. Amin's soldiers were on the alert. Their orders were to make sure that no ordinary soldier temper with property that was to be passed on to one officer or another. The thefts that took place were few and far between. But one common loss united those expelled in 1972. This was the loss of home. A sense of belonging develops over generations. The generation that was expelled lived as strangers afterwards. Musafir in Hindustan, Hindustani. Wherever they landed, they lived as if always ready to pack their bags and leave at short notice. Many of their houses had more the feel of guest houses rather than homes. My next book is about Amin, the master perpetrator. The flip side of Asian victim narratives has been another industry, equally a chorus united by a single aim, to demonize Amin as an uncivilized brute. Mark Leopold's 2020 book called Idi Amin shines a critical light on this barrage of writings and media depictions of Amin that followed three expulsions. First of the Israelis, then of the Asians, and then of the British. This book is not on Amin, nor on his self-appointed, self-proclaimed victims, but on how the discourse on Amin changed direction from praising Amin as a noble savage who delivered the country and the continent from the erratic dictatorship of Obote, from that to demonizing the same Amin as an African Pol Pot in the words of a British minister who had earlier ordered Amin's assassination. Leopold's point is that these books would be better read as a source of knowledge on those 
who wrote to them the Nonamin, who they purported to write about. The leading writer we all know was Henry Chamber. Okay. He began this genre of writing. The final book I want to talk about is my colleague's book, <laughs> Professor Ruangarunyu's Redefinition of Uganda as an Indian Colony. This book has just come out recently. It merits inclusion in this slim reading list. Professor Runigo is a Makarere historian who had previously written two great books, one on Kabaka Mwanga, the Kabaka who fought the British at the turn of the 20th century, and the other on the land question about the Bakopi and the Milo landlords. He's also a good friend. Let's begin with the title, Uganda and Indian Colony. The title is a stunner. It provokes, almost compelling the passerby to buy it. The title is a publisher's dream. Most of us are used to thinking of Uganda as a British colony. But an Indian colony? I ask myself, is this a commercial ploy? But then almost habitually, I turn to the back side of the jacket. The back side of the jacket reads, quote, the long and short of this book is that it puts the spotlight on Indians in East Africa, narrating them as deputy imperialists, sub-imperialists, privileged workers of the colonialists. So between the cover and the back side of the jacket, we have descriptions of two different books. The cover says, Uganda was an Indian colony. The back of the jacket says, Uganda was a British colony in which Indians were privileged assistants, sub-imperialists. It'd be good to have Professor Runigo tell us which is the real title so that we can hope for a second edition with just one title. The cover is about Uganda Indians. The back of the jacket says it's about Indians in East Africa. So were Indians sub-imperialists? This is hardly an original story. There has been a whole tradition of Ugandan scholars writing on the subject of sub-imperialism from the 1960s. And their theme has been that the Baganda were sub-imperialists. In the conquest of Bunyoro, in the conquest of Eastern Uganda, led by Kakungu, and in the conquest of the rest of the country. As the literature on sub-imperialism developed, the claim of sub-imperial powers who colluded with the colonial project changed into a recognition that what had changed was really the nature of colonialism. Direct rule had changed to indirect rule. An indirect rule could only be exercised through intermediaries. Good historians have the skill to dig into archives and come up with little known or even previously hidden facts. Professor Runigo is an acknowledged historian. There are few facts in this book that I would dispute. I would dispute the idea that most Indians had companies registered overseas. Two Indians. Give me a third example. I would dispute the idea that 
all the Indians who made good in London made good because they went with money from here. Requires facts. I don't know of any. And I have read lots of biographies of those who made good. Often the fact is drawn from the thesis, the conclusion. The conclusion precedes the fact. The riddle of Luanga, Professor Runigo's book, is that he announces the framework in the title, dilutes it in the back of the jacket, and then abandons it in the bulk of the book. For Uganda Asians, however, it's important to read Professor Runigo's book, for it provides an important source of self-critique. When I read Professor Runigo's account of the conference Amin had held with Uganda Asian leaders in the months before the expulsion, I was outraged at the historical failure of these so-called leaders. Amin opened the first conference with a list of Indian shortcomings, social exclusion, a business culture rife with deception and lies, a self-justifying racism that justified petty privileges colonialism conferred on them, while at the same time blaming the British for the colonial legacy, and a weak commitment to either the larger society or the country at large. He then went, to, went on to invite the same leaders to reflect as a community on the way forward, which these lead leaders, so-called leaders, refused to do, because they said, we are a small group who can only leave it to the government to define the way forward. At a critical juncture in the history of both the country and the Asian minority, this was akin to abdicating responsibility. But this response illuminates their larger character. The Asian leaders were an economic elite, not a political elite. They never aspired to power, unlike other minorities in the region, say white settlers, the Nubi, or the Tutsi. Their political instinct was never to usurp power, but always to nestle close to those in power to look up to them for a road map to a future. They aim to control the market, not the state. Minorities who aspire to rule, like the Tutsi or the Nubi or white settlers, were at times the target of genocidal prospects, but not the Asians. They would be expelled, not killed. Asians in Uganda, as in East or Southern Africa, were immigrants. They were not settlers. The difference is telling. Immigrants are prepared to be part of the political community to which they move. Settlers aim to create their own state, their own political community, a colony. More precisely, settler colony. Settlers are always at odds with native communities among whom they live. It is difficult to find a settler without a gun. It is just as difficult to think of a Dukawala with a gun. As an individual, the Indian Dukawala is proverbially known for accommodation, even timidity. This is hardly the human material from which to make conquerors or colonists. It is, though, the material from which to craft merchants. When an elite emerged from communities of Dukawalas, they were an economic elite, not a political elite. When Indians used guns during the 1958 trade boycott, these were plantation owners, not the Dukawalas. They were both Indian, but they belonged to different classes. The political elite are more likely to st 
strategize the future. The economic elite are more likely to accommodate to it. Even when champions of industry or trade, like the Guptas in contemporary South Africa, or the Madhvanis under Robote I, aim at state capture, they do so in collaboration with existing political leaders. They do not become political leaders. They are, of course, there are, of course, exceptions such as Rajat Niyogi, the editor of Transition in Uganda at the dawn of independence, or Pio Pinto Gama and Makhan Singh and others in Kenya, but they were not Asian political leaders, neither in their calling, nor their imagination, nor the following they mobilized. They looked Asian, but they didn't act Asian. Maybe this is why they do not find a place in Professor Runigo's narrative, for they did not fit his argument. I'm coming to a close. As we think of the Asian legacy 50 years later, I leave you with five observations. One, there is no one Asian legacy. There are several legacies, and they are contradictory. Not all are legacies we would like to wipe out from our collective memories. Some we would like to build on, others we would like to reform. Number two, the Asian question can allow us to think the larger Ugandan question. Think of any of the big questions in this country, the Buganda question the Northern question, the Karamoja question, and the Asian question. There is one thing common among these four. The state has always claimed the right to solve each of these, first to define each of these, then to solve each of these on behalf of society, and always through violence. And it has never been successful. The result has always been perverse. State strategy has always been to set up one group or another, the Baganda at one point, the Asians at another, the Northerners after 1986, and the Karamojong all through our post-independence history, to set one or the other up as the enemy of society. Number three. The great strength of African societies in the pre-colonial period was the ability to absorb newcomers, immigrants. The Baganda, for example, are said to have begun as four clans in the 13th century. Over centuries, they absorbed both immigrants and indigenous or original. both immigrants and those they conquered. But there was no distinction made between indigenous originals on one side and those non-indigenous on the other side. The African tradition is to integrate, not to segregate. Look around the continent. The capacity to integrate has been common to the Amhara, the Arabs, the Hausa, the Baswahili, the Zulu, I can go on with examples. The newly independent of East African countries followed the colonial tradition and not the tradition of pre-colonial times. The clause on citizenship in the independence constitution of Uganda distinguished indigenous from non-indigenous residents. Not those born in Uganda from those not. Not between residents and non-residents. Indigeneity was defined by having at least one grandparent born in Uganda. This ruled out, as I have said, over 90% of Asian residents of Uganda from a birthright to citizenship. The 1995 constitution further entrenched this prejudice by acknowledging indigenous groups as tribes in law. After 1995, this government has restricted local government by multiplying restructured local government 
by multiplying district boundaries on the principle that each minority be recognized as indigenous and granted its own district. The alternative would be to acknowledge the equality of all residents in a territory. Number four, the Asian question has not gone away, it remains. But it is no longer the original Asian question. The new Asian question emerged in the Museveni period. It has two features. One, the new Asians are not considered Ugandans, even if some of them may hold Uganda passports. For President Museveni, they are investors, not citizens. As investors, they are bearers of property, not of rights. They have neither political rights nor political obligations. They may be here year after year, but they live as permanent strangers without obligation to community or country. In the African imagination, they have become the prototype of a mercenary community. For the Asians, they live on sufferance, always on guard, never at peace. We may ask ourselves, in whose interest is this state of affairs? Certainly not in the interest of those identified as Asians, nor of the people of this country. The question merits further reflection. Finally, number five. In the transition between two constitutions, 1972 and 1995, Ugandans have changed our notion of belonging. The 1995 constitution defined entire groups and not individuals as indigenous. Between constitutions, new groups try to petition parliament to be included in the list of indigenous groups. Several years ago, many such groups sent in petitions, including the Banya Rwanda, the Somali, and the Bahindi. President Museveni's response was to remind the Bahindi that the world is divided into continents. God made each continent for a different race. Europe is for whites, Asia for browns and yellows, and Africa for blacks. Like the notion of indigenous, this story lacks a sense of history or its sense of history is based on biology. It has forgotten a basic fact of history that the human race began in Africa. It has also lost a sense of how the world is changing, including decolonization. Today, American law recognizes African Americans as Americans of African descent. One of the two contenders for the post of Prime Minister in the UK was born in India. The Indian and Pakistani states acknowledge the existence of South Asians of African origin, known as Siddhis. There is a Siddhi member of parliament in Pakistan. Some time ago, Ugandans of South Asian origin formed an organization called Asian African Association of Uganda. I want to cite from the preamble the statement of purpose of this organization before I sit down. Quote, whether citizen or not, whether in the country for generations or fresh off the plane, all persons of South Asian descent in Uganda are identified as Bahindi. For someone who thinks of Uganda and Africa as home, to be called a Muindi is to live in the past, to ignore our present, and to be blind to the future. It is to live in this land as if one were a visitor. You cannot be a permanent visitor. That is a ticket to permanent insecurity and political isolation. We need to give a deep thought to who we really are and what is our relationship to Africa and African society. We are not South Asians. Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, for South Asians live in South Asia and are committed to making a future there. 
nor are we overseas South Asians who are part of a South Asian diaspora whose members aim to return home to South Asia after a temporary sojourn overseas. True, our origin is South Asia, but our present is African. Many of us hope to make a future in Africa. We are Africans of Asian origin, Asian Africans. I leave you with that sense of self-identity which points to a different politics and a different future. Thank you.